Hi, it's Robin. Tonic Endum wrote, could you please show how a SID file loaded into memory can be played back while allowing a basic program to still run? I've got that working here right now. This is actually a basic program running. And you hear that the music is going. And if I hit stop, the music keeps playing. And I can list my little basic program there. So this is using interrupts to play the music in the background while a basic program can run in the foreground, so to speak. This is kind of like multitasking or uh, from the DOS days, a TSR, I believe, terminate and stay resident. And this really blew me away the first time I ever saw it. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about SIDs, how to play them. Okay, and we can stop that just by hitting stop restore. Today I'm going to be using this donation that Mikkel from Sweden sent. Very nice condition, Super Snapshot version 5, and this is ROM version 5.22, which I actually don't have. He also sent this very nice postcard from Sweden, and a very nice bottle opener. Thank you very much, Mikkel. That's very generous of you. Now, just to explain what a SID is, sometimes we just call SID, well, the SID is the sound interface device sound chip built into the Commodore 64 and Commodore 128. Sometimes people mean two different things by SIDs. We mean just any music that's playing on a Commodore computer, but there's a specific use for it that crept up. I don't know if it started in the 90s or the 2000s. SID players arrived on the scene. Essentially, they're a dedicated Commodore emulator that emulates enough of the C64 so that music playback can happen. And there's a huge collection of these SID files on HVSC, the High Voltage SID Collection. I'll put a link to it down below. There's about 51,000 SID files on there. You can play them on your modern computer. There's players for Windows and Mac and everything like that. But somewhat surprisingly, they're not so easy to play on a Commodore computer directly. They're actually not a C64 executable. They contain C64 executable code and data, but then they have a header file on them that's used by the music player on the more modern computers. However, there are ways of getting them to run on a real Commodore. One of them is a program called PSID64. I think the newest version is 1.2 made by Roland Hermans. I'll put a link to that in the description below. It's an easy to use command line tool that will take SID files and turn them into Commodore executables, PRG files, that then you can run on your real C64. It has a variety of command line options. The default includes a player, and I'll just run one of those. Here's the converted SID file running on my 128 in 64 mode. And this particular song was written by both me and my friend Darren, who is the creator of the Invader game that uh, I had him on the show a while ago to look at the game he had made. So this is one we wrote, what, 23 years ago now? Wow. Okay, so if all you want to do is play SIDs on your 8-bit Commodore, then this is an easy way to do it. Okay, but there's another command line option to not include this player, and because this player is not useful if you are wanting to play a SID in your own program. So we're going to look at that next. Okay, so by using the dash N option in PSID, you can strip out that player and just include the C64 code you need. I've got the Super Snapshot version 5 plugged in here. I'll go into the monitor and we will load this one sound, sound file I have. Okay, and this one was written by Darren. We can see it loaded to location 1000 hex and it ended at 18F0. And if we disassemble at 1000, there's this jump table at the beginning of the program. Almost all SIDs have a jump table at the beginning. And the first call is to initialize the player. And the second call is what you play 
usually 50 or 60 times a second you call the second routine. And that is what keeps the music playing. You can't just call it once, it has to be continually called, but you can use a raster interrupt to do the calling 50 or 60 times a second. I'll show that later. Now, not all SIDs load to location 1000, though it is a common location. It totally depends on the game or the demo that it was from, depending on the memory map and the how the programmer and musician, or it might have been the same person, the programmer might have said, I need the music player to be at location 8000 or 9000 or C1000 or whatever, due to the memory map, due to the constraints of the particular production the game or the demo that's being made. I'm going to show a bunch of ways of playing these SIDs from BASIC and from machine language, starting with the very simplest one. Now, these simple ways, I don't really recommend them as being uh, the right way of doing it, but I think seeing a very simple example helps understanding. So we can actually make a program, we can actually play these from BASIC with no machine language. Well, I guess it's using machine language because the SID itself but if we poke 780, 0, that is putting a zero in the accumulator. And then we call, this is location 1000 hex, which is 4096 decimal. And then we sys 4099, and we go to 20. This is all that's required to play a set. The reason to poke a zero into the accumulator here well, this isn't poking it directly into the accumulator, but this is location 780 gets loaded into the accumulator uh, whenever there's a syscall. This initializes song zero. Some SIDs have many songs in them, and it's a common practice for that to be passed in the accumulator, the song number, when you initialize. And then this is what has to be called repeatedly it's usually the same as the initialization plus three. And then we'll go to 20. And there's one, one problem here, but we'll see it quickly. So it works, but obviously it's playing way too fast. Most of the time you can silence it by calling initialization again. So we're just gonna add a delay loop in because BASIC is calling this quite a few times too quickly. It needs to be calling it 60 times a second, which we can't control precisely from BASIC. So we'll just add a loop in like this. And through trial and error, I found that delaying seven counts, this loop doesn't do anything except just waste a bit of time. Okay, we'll give that a try. Okay, so that's running about right there. So if all you want to do is play the music, this, well, this works. I don't recommend it for a couple reasons. There's actually problems with the player conflicting with basic memory space there, which I'll show you how to solve later. Okay, now to do it from the machine language monitor. Okay, so we're going to assemble to location C1000. We'll Disable interrupts. We want to initialize with song zero, like I was mentioning earlier. We're going to call the initialize routine for this particular song that's location 1000. When you load the file, usually whatever its load address is, like here, 1000, is going to be that initialization. Okay, then we're going to wait for raster line 64 because 64 is a good number. 64 hex happens to be a hundred decimal. It's a good solid round number, right? Okay, and then we're going to wait for the raster line. And uh, I've shown that in previous videos, but we're just waiting for scan line 100, 64 hex. If it's not equal, we'll branch back to C1008 and keep waiting. It's just a busy loop. Then we're going to increase the border color. We don't have to do this, but it allows for a bit of uh, animation so you can see that the program's working. Now we're going to call that routine. That has to be called once per, usually once per video frame. 
and we'll decrease the border color and then we'll do it all again we'll branch up to 2006 or jump back up to the location C1006 and do it all again. Okay, go back to basic and now we can sys 49152, that's the program we just entered into memory at C1000 and let's see if it works. So that worked. One thing to note is that some music players use some zero page space and you should be aware of that when using them in your own programs. Some of them clean up after themselves really nicely. Like if they use zero page, they store, they take a copy of what's there, use zero page and then put it back. And they're doing that 60 times a second so that to the rest of your program, your game or whatever, it isn't aware that zero page is being used for anything else. But some SIDs don't clean up after themselves so nicely. So it's easy to check on that. We'll just look at memory zero. This is all zero page here. And in basic in particular, it's being used for all kinds of things, but we can use this little program we just wrote to test for this. We'll just fill memory from location two to location F with BB. And if we just look at memory now, we'll see, okay, we didn't fill location zero and one because those are special registers on the C64 for the memory map. But we'll just fill memory with all BB. Could be any byte. I like using BB. That's what Super Snapshot uses. And then we'll just go and call our music player at C1000. Okay, and we'll let it play for a bit. And then we'll freeze the computer and go back into memory. And we'll just look at memory again. And you see all the locations up to FF are still BB. If you're really paranoid that your music player was just putting <laughs> BBs in memory, you could fill it with a different byte like CC or whatever, and then look again. And if you do find that the player is using one of these memory locations, then in your own player, you can just take a copy of it, store it somewhere safe, and then put it back when you're done. You would just do that. Let's look at our little player here. So each frame right before the JSR 1003 in this example, you would just load whatever. If you saw it was using location F8, then you would load F8, store it somewhere safe, like further down location C in the C1000 block here for this example. And then after the JSR, you would just load it and store it back into location F8. Just something to be aware of if you find that music's crashing, your player's crashing on you, that may be why. So both those examples so far have allowed you to, uh, to play music from basic, but they don't allow another basic program to keep running in the background. For that, we're gonna to have to use interrupts and that's where it gets a little bit more complicated, but not that bad. So we'll go back in here and I just wanna show you location 314. This is the raster IRQ that BASIC uses and kernel uses, and it points to location. It's always in low byte, high byte format. So it points to location EA31, okay, which in turn calls FFE, A, and so on. Okay, so what this routine is, EA31, 60 times a second on both PAL and NTSC C64s. It scans the keyboard, it flashes the cursor, and so on. This is the regular IRQ service routine that is what makes the C64 usable when you turn it on, is this interrupt. You have to respect that. If you're going to want, if you want to do something else in the interrupt, then you need to either handle things like keyboard and flashing cursor yourself if you want to do that, 
or you at least have to make sure you call this if you are trying to wedge something else in there, your own routine. So I'll show you how to do that now. Okay, so again, we'll assemble to location C1000. You can put this elsewhere if you want. C1000 is just a free area on the C64. That's good for this sort of thing. So for our initialization, once again, we're going to set up for song zero, call the music initialization. Then we're going to disable interrupts temporarily. And we're going to point our new IRQ routine. And we're going to store that into that location 314, 315, that vector I just showed you. <laughs> just noticed I failed to type in the immediate sign. Yeah, I'll just correct that. Let's just take a look at where we're at. So this is telling the IRQ vector that we want to go to location C012 every time an IRQ happens, an interrupt happens. Okay, and I calculated that ahead of time because I had already written this program. We'll just continue. So we will now restore interrupts, clear interrupt disable, and RTS returns back to whatever called our initialization routine. Okay, so this is our initialization routine which both sets up the music player and initializes the interrupts. And now here we are at C1012, which I mentioned here is our actual interrupt handler. That's very simple. Again, we don't have to increase the border color, but I like doing it. And then we're going to call the music player and then decrease, decrement, and now we're just going to call EA31, which is the IRQ handler. So basically we've just stuck our little routine in and now we're going to continue as normal. That's all there is to it. We'll make sure that our SID is still loaded. Okay, and now here we are back in basic and we'll again sys49152, but this time, there. <laughs> so you can see that it's actually working at the same time as basic and we can write a little program again we'll do my favorite you'll notice how the border the raster bars are going up the screen that's because the screen is being refreshed at about 60 frames per second as the screen is redrawn here on my NTSC computer. And the IRQ handler is also running at about 60 frames a second, but they're not exactly in sync. So that's why that raster bar is gradually moving up the screen. It's a certain number of, I don't know if that's, I just take a guess, but they're off by maybe a few hundred cycles or something. And that's why you're viewing it, scrolling up the screen is because that interrupt isn't happening quite as often as the screen is being redrawn. Okay, now while that seemed to be working fine, okay, so I mentioned earlier that there is a problem. If your SID is located in basic memory, like this one at location 1000, then you're actually gonna run into a conflict with your basic program because eventually your basic program will overwrite part of the SID. One thing or the other will start overwriting each other and you'll end up with a crash. Just to make this clear, normally when you have a program, you just go like print hello. Okay, and that's entered into memory. If you just pop into the monitor and do a memory dump of 0801, you see here, there print, we did this in a previous episode, but 99 is the token for print. And there's a quote and then hello, you can see the text hello here right now. And then our SID would be at like location 1000. Is it still there? No, it's not. But anyway, <laughs> what we want to do is move basic memory up above the SID. So we can fix that with location 44 determines where the bottom of basic memory is. So if we change that to 32, and then we have to poke 
32 times 256. Just we need to put a zero in that location. And then new. We have now moved basic memory. That SID is at location 1000 hex, which is 4096 in decimal. In this example, I want to move it up to 2000, which is 8192. And so that high byte is what we're changing here. 20 hex is 32 decimals. So that's why I poked 32 into this location. It's the high byte of the bottom of basic memory. Because it's the high byte, 32 times 256 is location 8192. You have to put a zero in that location. Basic expects uh, there to be a zero at the beginning of basic memory or you'll get errors. So that's why that is poked in there. And now I can show you if we do that same program, 10 print hello, and go back into the memory or back into the monitor and look at location 2000. There, now you see that our basic program has been stored at location 2000. Now these first bytes are the line number and so on. I, I showed that in a previous episode. Okay, one more thing to show you. That last IRQ version was pretty good, but most people would rather have it synced with the raster interrupt, especially because you have PAL and NTSC incompatibilities. So you would want the song to play at the correct speed for your system. So one last time, we're going to pop into the monitor and we're going to write one more program. This will be the longest yet. I'll skip over some of it that I've already explained. We are going to kill the CIA interrupts that normally run the IRQ system. And this is how you do it. You load 7F and then you store that in the CIA register. I'll put that up in the corner. And then it's best practice to read back that value just to make sure that it clears the interrupt and disable. I don't think I can get into the super deep in this episode. Basically, we're stopping all interrupts from the CIA chip because we're, we want to instead use the raster interrupt from the VIC chip, which is normally disabled when you turn on the Commodore. Okay. Now we'll disable interrupts. We've disabled the source of the interrupts here. We've acknowledged it just in case there may have been a pending interrupt. Now we can safely disable the interrupts. I know a lot of people, you can do this other orders, but as far as I know, this is be best practice. You may get away with doing that in a different order. If anybody has any other opinions, please feel free to explain yourself in the comments. Okay, and now we're going to enable the raster interrupt, and that's with the bit zero, and we're storing that in the VIC. Then again, we want raster, well, let's do the same raster line 64 hex, 100 decimal, and we'll store that in the raster register. In previous episodes, or even earlier this one, you saw us pulling DO12. We can also write into it to tell it what raster line you want the interrupt to happen on. And then because the raster interrupt is actually a 9-bit value, eight the main 8 bits are here in DO12, but the high bit of DO11 stores the ninth bit of the raster line. So we'll just mask that out to make sure that it is zeroed. Again, just best practice. You can probably get away without that. And then finally, now we're just going to set the IRQ vector like we did in the previous example. We're setting it to C0 to C. Again, that's because I already worked out this program. If you're writing this yourself uh, and you don't know, this is why we use an assembler most of the time. You can just put a label in here instead. But if you're writing in a monitor like this, you can just put whatever value in and go back and fix it after. Okay, and finally, all our initialization is done. So we're just going to clear the interrupt, disable, and return. And now all we have to do is write our actual interrupt handler. So this is acknowledging that the interrupt happened. So whenever there is an interrupt, you need to acknowledge that you are handling that interrupt so that flag gets cleared and it doesn't cause another interrupt. 
And this is because you can have multiple interrupt sources that all go through the same vector. The CIA can cause it or the VIC. It gets hairy trying to handle multiple interrupts, but it can be done or to handle multiple interrupt sources. Okay, so again, with the raster, we're just going to increase the border color, call the routine, decrement the border, and then go through to our regular interrupt handler. Our interrupt is now being driven by the raster interrupt rather than the CIA, the timer interrupt. But regardless, we're still going to call the kernel handler so that it updates the keyboard and so on and the flashing cursor. Now, if basic compatibility isn't important to you, you don't have to do this, but then it's up to you to provide the keyboard handling if you want to read the keyboard and so on. Okay, that is it. Okay, once again, I'll make sure that our SID is loaded. Okay, and the moment of truth. Hey! Okay, you can see now how the border is steady again. Uh, now you can see how the border color changes are steady. Okay. Ooh, that was a long one. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Again, there's many other purposes for raster interrupts, different reasons for SIDs. You don't have to play it in basic. Uh, that was just the request, and I do find that interesting. I remember when I was a kid and I first saw this kind of multitasking, so to speak. I was just blown away that my computer could do two things at once. I could be programming in basic, and yet here was music playing or a sprite moving or whatever. That just <laughs> blew me away. So hopefully it's still interesting to you too. Okay. As always, thanks for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please do. I've been noticing that my view counts go up and down wildly. Uh, arguably some videos are better than others, but, you know, if I make a video about Super Mario Brothers and it gets 35,000 views, I make a video about, uh, Epic's Fast Load and I don't know, it gets 15 or 20,000 views, but then I make a video about, uh, Commodore 128, uh, Editor or something, which I find equally interesting, but obviously not all the audience does, so, you know, some of my videos are more niche. Uh, really appreciate any support. If you want me to make the more niche videos, uh, well, just speak up. <laughs> okay, thanks for watching. We'll talk to you next time.